All right, Sean Kelly here. Welcome to the Digital Social Hour podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Wayne Lewis. What up, what up? And our guests today, Michael and Brian Voltaggio. What's up, guys? Up, rock guys? star chefs are in the building. First chefs. What do y'all have against chefs? <laughs> I love chefs. I love Just Me having... too. I mean, they give us food. They nourish our bodies. <laughs> I love them. Everyone needs a chef. Right, everybody. Now bro. you have two. Right. Yeah, but you guys are rock two. stars. Well, that's a different level of you know art right there yeah, you've dedicated your lives to this right yeah we're just cooks that's it <laughs> we're, just cooks. Cooks. we're just the cooks <laughs> what age did you guys start cooking uh i mean i think what 14 15 years old 14, yeah. okay. uh, he's yeah. two years older than me i had to work under him my first time okay that went Wait, kind so of well or at not 14 well. you guys wasn't playing kickball y'all were like no, whipping up in the kitchen yeah, we we're straight up working because um you know we wanted to have things you know when you grow up you know really well off so right you know, we wanted to buy clothes, have cars, mm -hmm. you know, so we went to work at 14 years old, just to start saving up and doing mm -hmm. that. And we found ourselves rolling into the kitchen because it was fun. There's family. Um, there's enough hours to work, uh, right. you know, because we could work at night right. you know, in the restaurant industry. So it's kind of outside. But I think that work ethic that we have, like we, we were joking when we got here, we've been working like 120 hours a week. And yeah. that's, that's real. Like we've been yeah. doing that. But mm -hmm. what's funny is we were working like that in high school. Like we'd go to school. Then I played football, so I'd go to football practice. Right. Then I'd get off football practice, go to work, work another like seven hour shift, mm -hmm. go home, go to bed and get up and do it all over again. Wow. To the point, like by the time I was 16, I moved out of the house. I had my own apartment. I was in high school. Wow. Having my own place to live. Like it was crazy. wild. It yeah, was that's like, wild. so I had responsibilities yeah, yeah, when I was yeah. 16 years old. Wow. And I think I've just, we've had the same job ever since. It's just different kitchens, mm. different menus and different, different people. Uh -huh. And did your parents get you guys into cooking or how did that start? I mean, food was always a big part of our family. Like, mm -hmm. Mom made sure we sat down every day at 530 or so and had dinner together, mm -hmm. you know. Um, you know, so I think that that appreciation for food definitely carried through in our career. I think yeah. we started cooking because money was a motivator at the time when we were right. teenagers. Right, right. But then it became a passion. Like then, then we got to a point where both Michael and I decided we we're going to make a career out of this. Mm. Um, he went off and did an apprenticeship at a Greenbrier in, in West Virginia and a pretty you know, obviously an amazing resort and well-known uh, program. And I went to the Culinary Institute of America in New York. So we kind of like split off at that time. That's when we both left. You know, but then we town. still had, while doing that, had to find other ways to hustle to like yeah. financially support ourselves. Through yeah. Like Brian was delivering Domino's Pizza while he was at <laughs> the most prestigious culinary school. Right. I ironic. would hang out in the mountains and like butcher deer in like somebody's front yard to like make enough money to get through the winter. Like mm -hmm. stuff like that. Like just the grind of... And I, I feel like that really our work ethic is, and I keep saying that, but like hard work is, is what yeah. it takes. I mean, mm -hmm. people are like, how did you get to do this? How did you get to do that? And it's mm -hmm. like, when everyone else was at the bar, we were at work. Right, right. And so so y'all had no social life coming up pretty much. Uh, I mean, a little bit, it still fit in bit. some time, but not, not, <laughs> not the greatest. I mean, definitely yeah. like we're in high school and stuff, as Michael was saying, you know, on Saturday night, we were cooking in a kitchen until yeah, 10 o'clock yeah. at night. We weren't out like, you know, the you know the party after the football game our social course. hour was between like midnight and 8 a.m right so wow. you had to like you had to fit it in <laughs> midnight you know? and 8 a.m yeah, that was, and nothing good happens between midnight yeah. and 8 a.m yeah. Like, yeah that's late what's the difference between an apprenticeship and culinary school well i think for me i just didn't want to follow the same path as brian and so yeah. and i where he paid to go to school basically and did that, like I said, delivering pizzas. Yeah, yeah. I got paid to do my apprenticeship. And so it was like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm gonna take this route. And so you go work at a hotel, mm -hmm. they have this sort of mapped out education yeah. or trajectory for you to learn every station. But what was funny is I thought I knew a lot before I got there. And mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm going to this resort in the mountains in West Virginia. I'm gonna be great, I'm gonna be a star. I was like 19 years old. And like on the first day, like I was making like veal stock and I like, move the vegetables in this like wave of oil just went over my hand and i remember i burned my entire hand Damn. and i remember like not being able to say anything because i didn't want them to send me home or i didn't want to get sent yeah, to like yeah. the emergency room or whatever so i had to like hold a kitchen towel over my hand and it stuck into my burn and by the end of the night i had to like peel it out of my burn because oh, i didn't want to go to my damn. boss and be like because i was so arrogant and cocky at the yeah. time and then I was like, dang, I have so much to learn right now. And so my career really started there. at that point. You know, it was like, okay, I don't know shit. So what actually broke you? Is that the moment where you had that breaking point where, damn, I got to... I think when I was learn. pulling kitchen towel out of my hand, I was like, okay, I have <laughs> I a lot to learn it. right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Wow. And do you think culinary school, school was the right move for you? I mean, I, th I think it 
got me to where I am now and it opened up mm. a door that I'd never thought that I would go to, which was New York city. Mm. Um, cause I was upstate New York. I was able to go down on weekends and actually start to do what's called a stage where you go in and, and work in kitchens to get right. experience and also hopefully get a job. And then I did my apprenticeship program, um, at a restaurant called Oriole, ironically, it's a restaurant we took over here in mm. Vegas. Mm. Um, and it, where I got to meet, uh, chef Charlie Palmer. And that's, that's where I kind of got my start in New York. Okay. I don't think I would have ever thought as a young cook coming out of Maryland, Frederick, Maryland, to 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 go to New York City. Yeah. And, you know, think that I had a resume to get in the door. That's like a dream, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it is. I mean, yeah. it's like felt like big leagues, right? Yeah, but then at that point, though, I realized that after I've, you know, this this many years in, really, it's just the hard work, dedication yeah. and being there and, and, and willing to learn as a young cook. You mm -hmm. don't have to go to culinary school. You don't have to do an apprenticeship program. You can if you have the means. Definitely it's mm -hmm. going to open up more doors. Yeah. But if you're great at what you do and you want to learn, just come knock on our door. Right? Mm -hmm. you know? So when 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 did you guys get to the point where you actually started to experiment and create your own styles and your own taste and like, you know, just kind of experiment with the food that, you know, mm -hmm. you guys are making. Well, I think early on in our careers, we're definitely, you know, it's an ego driven sort of thing. Yeah. Being a chef, right. You're creating dishes, you know, sometimes for yourself versus your guests. And I think there's been a transformation in our careers to where we are now. And it would be in like our early thirties, you know, we both had our own restaurants and like, you know, yeah. we're you know trying to make a name. Right. Um, now we, we take cues from our guests you know now we're like what what are our guests looking for we're more of a guest driven experience yeah. versus being a chef driven but so. it's hard though because as creatives you 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 want your creative process to inspire yourself but right you have to do it in a way where you're going to inspire the people that you're doing it for right and i think as you mature through any creative industry like that's the you have to connect with your audience right or if you leave them behind then that's a portion of the people that could have been coming in to experience whatever it is that you're trying to communicate right, to them. Fact, and so yeah. I feel like once we got, we started, we tried to be too creative early on. Yeah. Mm. And then what's just, being too creative? Early <laughs> yeah, well, because I feel like you, you're creative for creative sake. And sometimes right. it doesn't translate into what you're doing. Right. And so you leave people out because you want to show them this one technique that you learned how to do. Yeah. But if it doesn't taste good, you shouldn't be doing it. Right. Or if it's not That's better than the original true. dish that you're sort of, reinventing then why did you reinvent it yeah, and true. so like when we talk about like retro we have a caesar salad on our menu and i just posted this on my ig the other day it was like caesar salad was created almost a hundred years ago in tijuana mexico mm -hmm. and everyone thinks about caesar salad they're like that's italian food like yeah. it was created in mexico i thought that was italian. and so sure. we we at retro we're adding a little bag of parmesan reggiano churros mm -hmm to sort of bring those two dishes together mm. or those two cultures together right. in the same dish okay. and remind people like there is history behind the food you're eating. There is a story behind it. And so like a lot of the food we're cooking now, we're trying to build the dishes off of a foundation so that we can tell those stories mm -hmm. our way. Gotcha. And so, I mean, for this project that we're doing here in Vegas and the fact that that's the reason why we're sitting here is a couple of your, your boys came yeah. in the other night and had it yeah. like, that's what we want to happen. Gotcha. We want people to stumble in there and be like, wait, what is this? Oh, shit. Yeah. wow, this is great. This yeah. is and and have fun and be engaged in how we sort of flip the space, how we flip the menu yeah. and how we're telling our story right now. Yeah, yeah. That he uh, he cooked uh, fried chicken and cornflakes. Really? And I, I was like, wow, I've never had that before. But it so makes sense because you yeah. think about cereal has sugar in it. Not that yeah. I'm trying to promote sugar right now, right, but right, like, right, right. For, we used to make this cold fried chicken sandwich. And yeah. like when you fry chicken that's breaded in cornflakes and then you let it sit out and it gets cold, that yeah. sugar is caramelized now because you fried it. So now all of a sudden you get that crunch. And like, mm. this is what I'm talking about, how, you know, our creative process has shifted yeah. from how do we make it obvious that we're being creative to like, Wait, how did they how did they get it to just do that part? You yeah. Know? And yeah, that's that's, that's right. more where our minds are at now. Mm, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I've heard great things about retro and you guys are partnered with MGM. How did that mm -hmm. partnership happen? Well, our partnership started back in well, twenty fifteen is when we got um started the conversation. There's a, a you know, a big resort that they were building in um National Harbor area, which is just in Oxon Hill, just outside of Washington, DC. Both Michael and I from Maryland, it was kind of a natural fit. They came to us and said, Hey, you know, we want to build a steakhouse. You know, Michael and I then came back to them and said, wait a minute, we want to build a steakhouse, mm -hmm. like rooms of a house. Like you're coming over to dinner at the Voltaggio Brothers house and having steak. Yeah. So um, they, it's a lot they, nicer than any house we ever lived. Yeah, you know? yeah, we're like, sure. we, we were like steakhouse. And they're like, yeah, you guys have the steakhouse. We're mm -hmm. like, no, we want a steak house. We yeah. want a house. And they were like living room, kitchen, dining room, library, which 
I don't. I've never had a library before. Yeah, it sounded, like, it sounded like an important room to have yeah, in the yeah. house. Right, right. And we were like, okay, these this company gets it. Like they're mm. gonna put the support mm. behind us to like whatever we can dream up. They'll bring it to life. Mm. And then fast forward to how many years later, we did a couple pop ups at Bellagio. We mm. tested some things to see how we would do here in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and they were like how about a spot at Mandalay Bay and we'll mm. do it as like a residency and you guys can sort of be yeah. here for as long as this concept should or could be here for. And so we thought up retro, which was, you know, it's kind of a nod to like back to Brian said earlier, it was about the ritual of dining, the ritual of sitting down at the dinner table mm. and having all those like sort of conversations around food with our mom. Right. She made casseroles. She made mom food. She made mm. like Frito pie and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, right. And we were like, how do we sort of, go back to that moment yeah. when we did first start feeling like what food could make us feel like and why we were doing it and the people we were enjoying it with how do we create that vibe the origin right. and that yeah, yeah exactly origin, and yeah. so we even found like those white casseroles with the blue flowers the mm -hmm. corning wear, like mm -hmm. yeah. vintage ones from all around the country and we told the whole like mgm was like let us help you source stuff and then the conversation kept going they were like what about sporks what about yeah. like little boxes that you could serve like we, we wanted to make general snails like we're making escargot and the mm. flavor of general tao's chicken so we're like wow. general so chicken wow. as snails i would eat that and then we're making like a bowl <laughs> of seaweed rice with it so yeah. everything just sort yeah. of like sometimes got inspired by the vessel or the idea mm. but the whole experience every single dish is nostalgic mm. and i think yeah. that we live in a time now where you have to sort of approach a situation with like inspiration not intimidation yeah. so we're like trying and to do it take like some that. risk because that's a totally different menu because most like yeah. you said you go, we go to most places and it's pretty much the same style like yeah. you know we order i mean i'm ordering salmon and mash everywhere i go and lobster mac you know but in this in this instance it's like a totally different menu it's you got to right. think about what you want or try everything on there well i mean we made we also, shells and cheese yeah, and you so also want can't... his lobster mac like come get our lobster <laughs> thermidor and get our shells and cheese where we hand make all the shells individually wow. and then we have a cloud of aerated cheese sauce that we make that comes out of a siphon that like sit you gotta come you gotta yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you also can't deny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and, and we'll no one can deny the fact, yeah, whether yeah, yeah. it be growing up in childhood, college, whatever, yeah. that you haven't had a can of SpaghettiOs, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. And so what we've done is we've recreated that, you know, mm. sort of childhood experience right, that we've right. had. And I'm not saying you know, I haven't not had one in a long time, too, because maybe I had one a few weeks ago. <laughs> but ours is different. So we do is make these, yeah, R and D, right? So we make this, you know, giant meatball mm -hmm. that we place in the center of it, made with you know veal pork and 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 really great wagyu beef, and mm -hmm. then. Uh, at the table, what we do is we make all of these O's that we hand make, you know, mm. this pasta. And then we put it in an Arabiata sauce, which is um, basically Pomodoro with just enriched with brown butter. And then we pour that table side out of the can. Mm. So you still get kind of that feeling that you, you had, like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. then when you bite into it, it's like, this is the Way version. Wow. But it brings you right back <laughs> yeah, to childhood. Yeah, that's that's fire. Yeah. How important is food presentation to you guys? I think with this concept, it was less about it was more about like the vessels and like the reminders of where the dish came from than like, and then ironically enough, like Brian and I, we are the architecture of the food that we do mm -hmm. always has like some little nuance, some little texture, mm -hmm. some little surprise on it that yeah. like makes it look different. Yeah. Like our key lime pie, we're making them look like little limes on a plate and we're spraying cocoa butter on the outside that's mm -hmm. green. And so we've got like three little limes on a plate. And then we were like, well, when you eat key lime pie, you eat it at the beach. So let's right. make some sand out of coconut. And so the key oh, limes are fine. sitting in coconut sand. And then it's mm -hmm. like coconut sorbet. And then we're like, what about the meringue part? But like whipped up egg whites sometimes don't taste good. So what if we make whipped up yuzu juice and stabilize it with mm -hmm. a starch and dehydrate it so that you get the meringue, but it's just something scientist. that disappears on your palate. Yeah. <laughs> you hear this, Sean? But yeah. we just like, <laughs> you know when you have that hamster on the wheel in your brain that's like yeah. running like this? Yeah. And sometimes you have to tell it to just slow down a little yeah. bit. But how, how do you guys turn that off? Like at home, like who who cooks? You or the wife? Oh, like, are yeah, you, you guys got to do, do chefs have to date chefs? Like, how does, <laughs> how, how does this work? I mean, we definitely cook differently when we're at home. You know, more like one, two, you know, three ingredient dishes. You yeah, know, very, yeah. you know, more on the simple side things you want to eat when you're you know comfortable yeah. at home. Okay. So you guys um, do turn it off. The creative yeah, fire yeah, but well, sometimes. I mean, just because we save a lot of it for the restaurants. You know, back yeah, to like yeah. the techniques. You know. A lot of the technique early on in our career, we did it because of the, the for the technique, you know, okay. going back to that key lime pie, that meringue you were just talking yeah, about. Yeah. We know now how to put together textures and flavors that make sense. Like we're, gotcha. we're looking for inspiration, going back, looking at the dish and recreating it. And yeah, we can pepper in these things because for now we're good at what we right. do. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? When it comes to that, I'm not saying, but you know what I mean? You know, and putting the dish together. 
And so we're able to, to use all of those tools we've learned over the last like combined 50 years mm -hmm. of experience that we have and make dishes make sense. How, how At home, guys... sometimes we have to like kind of turn that part yeah. off. Yeah, but... <laughs> you know what how, I mean? How do you guys actually, um, you guys even, do you guys ever worry about will this resonate with the consumer? Like, mm -hmm. is this going to be good to them? How do you guys decipher like, is this the play or is this not the play? Should we just keep it original? Like, how do you I think that you balance the risk? is is the best question because yeah. i think being able to do that part mm -hmm. is is what made us is it's what makes retro make a lot of sense right because we did ask those questions because we knew who our audience was sort of going to be when we came or who okay. we were going to go after and it wasn't just a select group of people right. we wanted to get everybody mm. we're like how do you create a concept that's going to leave no one behind right right whatever reason you're in las vegas whatever occasion it is whether you're with your kids or you're a bachelor party or whatever it is how does this concept how, how do you make it attractive to everyone and accessible to everyone right and without breaking the bank too it's like maybe we make all these intricate things and we put them together in a way that's like where it's connecting to a dish or something they've had before but also put it in the middle of the table so everyone can share it so you're now not like committing to this one dish this is mine and everyone right. just like family style that's mm -hmm. yeah it's family style right. but so then we were like well the vessels need to like lean into that part of the experience as well. Gotcha. And so even the plate, when you sit down in front of you is a ceramic paper plate, looking like the like the old flimsy white paper plate <laughs> wow, that you would have at a backyard right. barbecue. That's, 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 We're like, these are the plates that you eat off of and the yeah. food's gonna hit the middle of the table. Yeah. And crazy. so we thought, we tried to think about every single thing, but we also turned the space around in two weeks time. Yeah, yeah. And that's the insane. fact that the hotel, I mean, everyone from their creative team to their like, techie digital like i don't know all the different departments yeah. but i would say it was all hands on deck even down to like sourcing the plates a lot of it came from dead stock that and they took out of service weeks. from old hotels in mm -hmm. vegas wow i mean there's there's a lot of planning leading up to it i mean we started really in march you know getting ready for this with you know countless meetings you know mm -hmm. on, on zoom and you know teams and you know that part the fun part about that was was seeing the enthusiasm of the team. Like it was, yeah. it was a meeting that everybody wanted to log on to. Right, That's right. We weren't dreading. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So every week it was just like there was something new. There's a new idea. There was a you know a, a it, biggest thing I think that we we're worried about was how we were going to take an existing space and transform it and make it ours. The art mm -hmm. team just did an incredible job because everybody knows that iconic wine tower that's there, right? It's mm -hmm. been there for 20 years mm -hmm. when it was a former space. Now what they've done is they've basically made it into a museum piece. Like it's a curated piece of like everything you would find, like, you know, um, inspiration of, 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 you know, items like, you know, Nintendos and skateboarding and things we kind of grew up with, you know, back in the eighties and the nineties. And it's so there's four sides of this thing that, you know, you want to go in and see it and walk all the way around it and take mm -hmm. photos of it. And so um, it's just, it, it was just an incredible transformation. So yeah, there's a lot of planning, but then when it when we hit the ground and the work had to start, it's two weeks. Th it was two weeks. Wow. <laughs> it was two That's weeks. Quick. And wow. we filled all of those hours of yeah. every day for sure. Why do you yeah, think a lot quick. of restaurants fail? Oof. I mean, a lot of it is obviously you know with with what's happening with the economy in general now. When you think about it, you go to the grocery store, you see the cost of food has gone up, the cost of labor, mm. just just for the home cook. But now apply that to the restaurant and then add the occupancy costs, the labor costs, all the other things. And you're taking a, you're talking about a business where if you had a 10% margin, you're celebrating. You're like, yeah, we put 10% to the bottom line. Right. Well, now as things get more expensive, that 10% turns into 5%, mm -hmm. turns into 0%, turns into negative percent. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden it's like restaurant prices haven't really been able to increase in a way like everything else. Right. You go to the store and you're like, oh, this steak used to cost $5 a pound. Now it's $15 a pound. Mm -hmm. But if you go to a restaurant and you're like, this dish used to cost $10. Now it's $50. It's like that part of it, people haven't really quite wrapped their heads around mm -hmm. yet. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that like restaurant Restaurants don't necessarily get to increase their prices as fast as everything else without losing their customer base. But mm. then you talk about real estate. I mean, that has gone through the roof. Right. We even noticed that right. after the pandemic, right. we saw real estate just go. I think a lot of real estate developers and hotels, and I think you look at like MGM right now, they really have the power to keep this industry alive because mm. they have the infrastructure to support people that want to get into this industry. Mm. And I think if you're building a massive office building, 
what better attraction than have a great restaurant? Go find a young chef that doesn't have the means or the capital to open their own restaurant mm -hmm. and invest in them so that you're investing in your own building with another amen amenity for the building. Yeah, and I think, for sure. Yeah, and I think it's like to hit them with rent, hit them with labor, hit them with food, hit them with all the other additional costs. Mm -hmm. It's getting harder and harder for restaurants to not only survive, but to do it at a level that people expect you to do it at. Gotcha. Mm. Yeah, I was upset when Chipotle raised their prices. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, back to that, I mean, I remember cooking in New York in, in late 90s, early 2000s, and, you know, the price of a three-course menu, like yeah. on average, is like $90. Right. right? Yeah. It hasn't changed. Mm. You even go back to New York City right now, pre menus are, you know, you see that more in that market, I think, you mm -hmm. know, where it's multi-course set price. They maybe have increased 10, 20%. Mm -hmm. But it's you know? not like it's gone up to $400. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, you know, but so it's just like the, the threshold of what the consumer will, mm -hmm. will you know, absorb, yeah. which is quite not there for the, the rate of, you know, our costs going mm -hmm. up. You so know? how do so. you guys mitigate your losses when it comes to the shifts in economic times? And I think you have to listen to your customer base right. and you have to react. You know, right. people are always like, well, do you read Yelp or do you read these things? Do you read these platforms where people are talking about yeah. you mm. you shouldn't read it because you'll get upset right but i think you have to <laughs> because you have to look for consistencies in the threads and if you start to see things that are repeated mm. you have a responsibility to react to that and correct that mm. and oh, i so think you actually read the yelp oh, i do to, it to uh, look for those consistencies if somebody's uh, like the I mean, mashed potatoes are too salty <laughs> over and over yeah, again yeah. then it's my it's my job to yeah. go taste the mashed potatoes right. and talk to the person in charge of that and say, hey, we got to dial back the salt. Wow. 12 people have said it, that the mashed potatoes are salty. And I think that wow. you have to you have to put your customer base in front of your own ego. Wow. And you have to listen to that. I wonder how many business owners actually do that, especially chefs. That's like, that removes, you're removing the ego completely and getting straight down to appeasing a consumer. Like, because mm -hmm. well, back in know, the day, like a server would bring a dish back to the yeah. kitchen and be like, the guest didn't like this. And the chef, some angry, you know, person's back there and be like, fuck them, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> but like, if it happens four yeah. or five times with the same dish, then maybe you don't know what you're talking about. Mm. Right. And you have to be able to ask yourself that question. Wow. wow. Have you guys ever gotten a one star review? I think I've gotten like a, I wish I could, one star is the least amount I can give. I wish I could give zero. <laughs> you know how far away I had to park? And I'm like, we had valet. Right. Like we had it right out front. Right. You didn't want to spend the $9. Right. So. right. And that wow. was like in my first restaurant in LA. We would get some of the wildest stuff. Like, <laughs> so I wish I could give a zero. I have to <laughs> park. Yeah. I'm sorry for that. You know, that's funny. What was it like battling on Iron Chef and Tournament of Champions? I mean, all that stuff that we do, because we do a lot of food competition. I mean, Brian and I did Top Chef, um, Iron Chef. Uh, we had our own show together, Battle of the Brothers. Right now, I'm filming a show with Bobby Flay called Triple Threat. Yeah. The competition part, what's interesting about it is it keeps us fresh. Yeah. You were asking about the creative process. Yeah. And those environments, it's almost like muscle memory. So when we do these food competitions, it's not like, this is my moment. It's more yeah. like, this is training my brain to be creative on the fly so that I can bring that yeah. back to my restaurants and my business. Yeah. So it's almost like, it's like exercising. Okay. And so we do this not because like, I want to be on TV. It's mm -hmm. more like, all right, this is a different discipline that we can learn mm -hmm. that we can then take back to work and apply to what our yeah. real job is, which is being chefs in our restaurants. Mm. Yeah. I actually watch uh, one of the um, uh, shows and you don't play like you about <laughs> your business for real. I'm mm -hmm. like, Wow, this is different back back. Well, you're also sure. working under a clock too, yeah, so yeah. you have to, you know, obviously get really great with like timing, right. you know, a, a dish and, and cooking and techniques. And so that is very relevant in our mm. world because then it applies to going back to the kitchen and realizing what we can do with our team and how we can build a mm. dish and make it executable for service. You right. know, so there's there's so many cues that we could take from the experience we have in competing. Um, and then also just like knowing that you're going to be judged instantaneously and you're getting that, that feedback, mm -hmm. like, Oh, could you use a little bit more acid, a little bit more solid? Like, you know, okay, I agree. And then you, you continue to now like hone your, your skills and your mm -hmm. palate to make sure that you're appeasing, you know, those, those judges and those people who are basically picking apart your food but in our restaurants. I mean, the good thing about our relationship and how we work as partners yeah. is that there's 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 definitely a lot of honesty between the two of us when we're putting up a dish oh, in yeah. front of each other yeah you know when we're doing it with our team our management team or you know you know even cooks in our kitchen and we're like hey you know what do you guys think 
a lot of times it's a little bit biased. You know, they're not going to like pick apart a dish for somebody you're kind of working for, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's it's harder to get that honesty. You have to like really extract it it from them. them, Even though we're very involved with our team, we want them to have a voice. Sometimes they're just not confident enough to to raise our hand, right? Yeah. There's no bullshit here. You know what I mean? Like we're talking about a dish. Right. Yeah, exactly. And so that that makes it faster for us to get, you know, dishes to to, to the finale. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? Like where we know it's good enough to hit the menu. What we'll is be the like, time limit? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. What is the time limit? Like, if I the, go to the, there to the restaurant, like, what's the, how fast should my dish be out? Like, what, what do you guys? You we know, always try to get the food out. Well, the thing about this particular concept at Retro, it's like, we want the food to always be hitting the table. So okay, we're not coursing you. it out where it's like, if you order a dish and you order a dish, you're both getting served. We don't want them to hit at the same time got because you. we want you guys to be like, oh, I was going to get that. Okay. And we're sharing this now. Oh, and so okay. every okay. five to six minutes, like something else should be coming out mm. or you should never be sitting without something in front of you. And so the plan was to always have food on the table. Got and you. that's, you know, it's kind of like a good metaphor for life. Like, yeah, always, yeah, you know, always have food you go, table. you got to have food on the, the table. table. And, and, and so um, we really like thought about it at that level. But, you know, and even back to the competition stuff and all the TVs, I mean, they're all just extra full time jobs that we keep adding to the roster. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. some of the dishes for this restaurant were conceived at 2 a.m. in the kitchen when no one else was around. Mm-hmm. Like the team would we would be the first ones in and the last ones out. And that's wow. kind of been our our schedule. Like wow. that's in every job that we've had. It's like you don't leave until the job is done. And the benefit of that style of service in a way that we handle the mm-hmm. flow of food going to the table enables us to finish a dish like right at the moment and send it to the table when it's at you know it's perfect texture you know the 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 temperatures of the dish are mm-hmm. exactly where we want them to be mm. you know we're serving um a, a tuna dish it's a ceviche right now that has a coconut ice that has the flavors of tom Kass, or um tom kai soup and so we freeze that um coconut ice mm-hmm. like at the moment using liquid nitrogen and we don't want that waiting on another dish mm-hmm. you know it hit the table we want that dish going out where right. the texture and, and plus the we created that dish perfect. at like two o'clock in the morning yes. dead ass about to get a fist fight we were in the kitchen like we got to make a tuna dish right now and we were like all right and so i w- like we went and grabbed a bunch mm-hmm. of stuff and we just stopped talking to each other and like an hour later this dish was born and we we're like huh this is one of the best dishes on the menu and we've been thinking about this menu for like three months and we just did this right before we got into like i mean it was heated because we're like we'll challenge each other in the moment i'll be like all right we're making a tuna dish what do you have he's like whoa what about this and like if we're our brains are going in two different directions Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then we got to figure out how to find that intersection right. well how do you find that intersection is it creating the two best different... of both yeah yeah like how, 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 what do you do <laughs> it, it can happen in many different ways um you know like, <laughs> we were working on an octopus dish the very next morning right. we got down there in the kitchen before everybody else even though we're last the uh, you know mm-hmm. night before what 2 30 3 in the morning back down to 8 30 again mm-hmm. and we're like we we have to finish this octopus dish because mm-hmm. we're going in a completely different direction than the original and then we had to stop and put the brakes on that for a lot of reasons and you know we just we we kind of just dug our heels in and just like went for it that one i think was a little bit more collaborative you, you know, know that we kind got... of anxiety where you feel it going through your veins and your fingertips yeah, and yeah. stuff and yeah. when you don't quite finish what you wanted to get done and you have to go to bed right and you can't sleep right if right. you don't figure out the plan mm-hmm. then you're not going to be sleeping for days and mm-hmm. so it's almost like your body's telling you like yo figure this dish out or right. figure out this fix this problem so you can sleep through right. the night. Yeah. Wow. And That's it commitment. becomes like that, you That's know? scientists, bro. There's the science of it. Yeah. You know, yeah, and ironically, the last dish that we completed to finish the menu is probably one of our top selling dishes, which is this octopus dish that we did right now. Mm-hmm. Oh, black octopus, octopus with uh, an aioli made with squid ink and um, you know, a saffron vinegar with lots of fat. It looks escalate. angry, yes. though. It looks like you can see the fight that we got <laughs> yeah, into on sure. the plate when you see it because it's like this... <laughs> black squid ink and this charred piece of octopus and like this little bit of color on top from this like saffron pickled mm-hmm. fennel and it's like all right they have a little bit of brightness left but then you taste it and you're like okay i get it okay. like and what makes it retro is this is inspiration from paul Perdome who created blackening spice back mm-hmm. in the 90s or, or 80s and 90s mm-hmm. and so you know that process of cooking we mm-hmm. applied to octopus which is very rare like i don't think we've ever seen a blackened octopus you know done in the way that we're doing it yeah. but yet 
all the familiarity of the flavors when you bite into it are there from your original, you know, oh, but it's okay. just done in a completely different way. And yes, there was, you could see the tension in that dish, you know, as it came together because <laughs> wow. of the way it's presented. Sometimes you just got to color outside the line. What's, right. uh, what's like the oddest, I would say animal or dish you guys never like had to put together. It was just like, how do we even like, from like either the ocean or land like what i used to have this show i used to travel around the world to conflict zones and mm -hmm. like bring two opposing sides together yeah. around the dinner table people yeah. that had war with each other so mm -hmm. i went to like wanda egypt israel sri lanka cambodia sarajevo all these different places when i was in i think it was cambodia there was this woman on the side of the road selling pig parts but like this little boiling cauldron of pig parts <laughs> and she was like First the eyeball, so I ate that, and the Ooh. juice like squirt in my mouth. No. I was having like a moment, <laughs> and then it was like, and then it was like pig roof of mouth is what she called it. So if you naturally you take your tongue and lick the roof of your mouth. Right. Imagine someone handing that to you and being like, "Try this," and you put it in your mouth, and you just think about that part of the animal <laughs> because mouth. the uh, pig roof of there was no other name for it. It was pig roof of mouth. So that was I think <laughs> the weirdest. The menu. That was the weirdest thing that I'd ever eaten was pig uh, roof of mouth. Oh, tarantulas too. I ate, I, you I ate tarantulas? Never, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Not me. I'm Never not again. Players. Never again. You haven't eaten anything crazy? No, I mean I've I've in Copenhagen I had a dish that was um well, a couple of different dishes. Mm -hmm. I mean, one was lamb eyeballs, very done in the very same way, but they're yeah. fritters. Like a chiclet of eyeball juice. Yeah, mm -hmm. and what they did was though, they served with a pair of glasses. So they were like the two <laughs> <Wow>. eyes. So, <laughs> so the glasses are there. So you're staring at these two fried eyeballs and you had to, you know, obviously pop into my mouth. Wow. Live live ants uh, have eaten. Live yeah, ants. Yeah, yeah, live ants. But actually it tastes, they have the flavor of um of lemongrass, which is pretty incredible. Which wow. is so why we're serving pot roast at Retro. Exactly. It's good <laughs> pot roast <laughs> <laughs> and pasta. Yeah, so ant eaters apparently don't like the flavor of lemongrass that's why the ants have oh, that, you know that as a defense mechanism but they're really good they're tasty wow uh, just make that's, sure you get in awesome. your mouth i could talk to you guys for face. hours we Man. gotta wrap up but yeah. it's been a pleasure any closing thoughts just yeah. come to reg i mean we ended up here because you know one of your homies came to the restaurant and put this together and i think that mm -hmm. that's the story that uh we hope this restaurant helps us tell and you guys yeah. should pull up. Like, yeah. that's it. He said yeah. it was a top five meal all time. Yeah, yeah. So wow. he said they got 60% of the things that were on the menu, tried everything on there. So that's incredible. I just think Las Vegas is, I, it's the, the most exciting food city there is right now just because of the resources that we have here to do things the right way. And I yeah. think that there's going to be a lot more restaurants coming to Las Vegas. That I, I think it'll never stop here. Oh, yeah. For the sure people here keep going. these restaurants going, and we appreciate yeah. that so much. I'm cool with that. I live here, so Literally. keep them coming. <laughs> right, right, right. Go all the way. Guys can follow me on Instagram at the creator. Sean Kelly, Digital Social Hour. Thanks for tuning in, guys. See you next week. Peace.